Welcome, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Market, Engage, and Sell to Buying Groups Who Want to Hear from You, presented by Influ2 and MarTech. I'm your host, Cynthia Ramsaran. Before we begin, if you have any audio issues, click the audio icon on your screen to enable your audio. If you have any viewing issues, you can use the Q&A section at any time to communicate with us. You can send questions directly to the speaker about a presentation at any time. Without further ado, let's get to the presentation. Joining us today is Narosha Methananda, VP of Marketing at Influ2. Welcome, Narosha. I'll turn things over to you. Thanks, Cynthia. I appreciate it. And thanks for, for being here. Um, so, you know, what I want to do is, if you'll allow, indulge me, I would love to go through um, and, and talk about account-based marketing and PowerPoint. You're probably asking why PowerPoint. Um, for those who know me, um, you know, I, I have a love of PowerPoint and I get, um, you know, I get uh, a bit, um, I, 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 you know, people make fun of me because, you know, it gets a bit of a hard time, but I really love it. So, um, you know, in this example, I'd like to reach out to the product marketing team at um, and the product team at uh, Microsoft to, to tell them, um, you know, how much I love PowerPoint. So, you know, if you take an account-based marketing approach to this, you know, you really, you look at your list of target accounts. Um, you know, from here, you, uh, I, I want to look at Microsoft. So, you know, at, at, as of last year, um, you know, Microsoft globally had 189,000 employees. And then from here, um, I want to look at uh, the team in the US because I'm assuming this is, this is where it's being developed. So 57% of, you know, that global team is in the US, which takes me to 108,000 people. Um, and then I want to look at uh, the, the the team in products. So across across the world globally, uh, Microsoft classifies about thirty three percent of their team um, being in, in product. Um, and and so this approximately, I, I'm assuming that this applies to the US as well. And that takes me down to thirty five thirty five and a half thousand people. Um, and this is usually where, from an account-based marketing focus, depending on your program and, and data sources, this is this is sort of where you get to. But I I want to get to you know the people in in the in the product team who are doing you know making PowerPoint. So I'm going to just make a and at least this is totally me, totally me making an assumption around this. Um, I'm going to make an assumption that about five percent of those people who are in product are focused on PowerPoint, and you know that takes me to around 1.7k. Um, you know, within that group. So essentially, you know, this is where buying group, you know, this is the, this is my buying group. This is who I'm focused on reaching. And while it's a very singular example, um, you know, this is where buying group marketing really takes you and focus, focuses you on the people that you want to reach. So, you know, this is a new, you know, a new term, a new acronym, BGM. Um, but what, what does it actually mean? It's, it's, you know, it's really an evolution um, to ABM. And what it means is really looking and looking at, identifying and engaging those buying groups and key decision makers inside your target account. So the people who actually want to talk to you or that you want to talk to. Um, and the way to, you know, the way to be able to do that is through like monitoring their engagement signals and their sentiment um, and, and making sure that those insights are coming back to sales and marketing to work through uh, for relevant and timely and, you know, uh, actions from that. And why do we do that? Essentially to create an experience that is responsive to where key decision makers are in their purchase journey. So, you know, from a, from a customer perspective, they don't really care if your communication comes from sales or marketing. They just want a holistic experience that's going to meet their needs of, of who they are within that group. Um, you know, and so don't just take it from me. I can be standing here and, and spouting whatever. But um, I did look at Forrester and Gartner, and this is something that they are also focused on. So I pulled a couple of stats from them. So according to Gartner, you know, the average buying buying team size is, you know, between 14 and 23 people, and that depends on the size of the spend. And then from a Forrester perspective, you know, they – for us to uh, sort of their stat around that is, you know, 66% of, of B2B buying group teams uh, are more than six people. And then Forrester goes on and they goes on, they've got a, a buying group manifesto and, um, and that sort of proclaims and declares that the B2B buyer is really a buying group. 
Um, so that's that's sort of, I guess, the the direction in which it's going, um, and and why it starts to be it starts to become important to really focus on buying groups. Um, you know, and what what I'd like to know know from um, the group and the attendees uh, today is who's who's taking this buying group approach. So you know, the question is: Is your organisation taking a buying group marketing approach? Uh, and the answers are um, yes. We're buying we're buying group marketing superheroes. We're actually actively building towards this approach, or we're not currently taking this approach. Tell me more. So I'll give you a minute to, to go through uh, and, and see some answers rolling through. Cool. We seem to have a, a bit of a quorum. So, um, you know, for the majority of you, I've, we've got uh, one, one response that someone who is, is a buying group marketing superhero, I, I would love to, I'd love to hear from you around um, what you're doing and how you're taking that approach. And perhaps um, we can, we at the end of the, you know, towards the end of the webinar, if you'd like to share, I, I would be really keen to hear from you. But I think, you know, the majority is we're actively building towards this or, or we're, we're starting to think about it. Um, you know, and so, you know, what I thought about was it's all well and good when you have, um, you know, when you have, uh, these new concepts, but what does actually does it actually mean in practice? So for me, the example that I want to take take us through today is an example that in, of Influ2 itself, um, and you know how it approach how it approaches buying group marketing, and it's still very much on this journey. But you know, in 2020 when COVID hit, um, you know it was surprise shock to everyone obviously. Um, but also it, what it meant from a marketing perspective that was that we had to really um, go wholly digital to be able to reach our audiences. So Influ2 launched uh, what's, what it calls its new reality campaign to really be able to show its uh, capability to its audience. Um, so at the top of the funnel, it was really about driving brand awareness and, and demand. And um, so, you know, the, the campaign consisted of uh, you know, social media or ads, and in this case, a Facebook ad showing the new reality in context, um, supported by a landing page and ad messaging. Cool. That's that. You know, that sort of bread and butter. But what what uh, the Influ2 platform allowed our team to do was to be able to track engagement for each uh, target individually, which allowed our SDRs to be able to, you know, us to be able to pass that engagement to our SDRs and for them to be able to follow up with those contacts who were engaged from our target audience. So you can see, you know, in this in this message here, Alina has reached out um, and the, and the um, prospect has come back and said, hey, yeah, I actually saw your, your Facebook ad um, because I never click on ads, but it, it got my attention. So it really starts to make your, it really starts to make your marketing a little bit more tangible when you're able to uh, pipe those insights between sales and marketing. Then continuing into the middle of the funnel, um, it was really around engaging our prospects and educating them to be able to provide cover for our SDRs um, to be able to take advantage of the engagement. So, you know, this was supported through the LinkedIn message that was sent through our SDRs. Uh, and sorry, excuse me, the LinkedIn message was sent through SD, uh, from outreach from our SDRs. And then that was supported through ads as well as related landing pages. And what's really, uh, what I really love about this is that it starts to humanize, you know, who the SDR is and it's, it starts to be relevant, pr pr propose relevant content before uh, even they've even spoken. Um, and you can see from there, the result is uh, a response in terms of uh, in terms of the outreach. So that's middle of funnel. And then the campaign sort of moved in through to the bottom of the funnel to be able to support um, our account executives in, in the conversations that they were having, to essentially to be able to conquer, convince and convert. Um, you know our key our key accounts and decision makers, and what this means is engagement across across the buying group um, with content that is quite personalized and customized to what the needs are of that account. So in this example, um, the the prospect was Autodesk, and and they do three D rendering, and on their website they had used this T Rex to illustrate you know what uh, what an output was of their product, and so. 
in this example, Influ2 took that T-Rex, they made a little adjustment to its leg, if you, if you can see that, um, and, and, and said, and related uh, like the Influ2 message back to uh, what Autodesk priorities were. And then accompanying that was um, a landing page that really spoke to their key pain points. Um, and that, that really helped in terms of being able to back up some of the conversations that we're having from a bottom of funnel perspective um, to be able to help uh, convert the account. So, you know, what this approach essentially um, allowed the Influ2 team to do was to extend our marketing efforts and connect the top of funnel down to the bottom of funnel to drive tangible and measurable results. Um, from a campaign reach perspective, you know, 183 accounts were reached, uh, 7,000 decision makers within that, and 60% of those were at a CVP or director level. Um, and this resulted in today, uh, nine direct conversions um, with a 581% ROI with three deals closed um, thus far from the campaign. So, you know, really what, what buying group, what buying group marketing means So it looks like Nurosha might have some technical difficulties, but she is joining us momentarily. There she is. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize. I was wondering what was happening with my um, with my display. No worries. Uh, why don't you go ahead and pick up where you were? I am gonna go off camera. Thank you, Cynthia. Apologies. Um, so where was I? I was in the middle of the funnel. So really being able to engage and educate with content, help sales with air cover to give them the best opportunity for when that, uh, when that account goes into pipe and into opportunity, um, you know, there's a strong, there's a strong consensus around that buying group. And it, in the last stage, it's about, again, convincing, conquering and converting um, to be able to like, Okay, Narosha, I think she's joining us again very soon. Be patient with us, please, while Narosha comes back on. There we go. Do I keep getting, dis <laughs> I keep getting disconnected? <laughs> yes, but you're back. So um, go right ahead. <laughs> okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, so, uh, what we we established are the fundamental pillars for executing buying group marketing, and you know across these three, uh, there's strategy. So at the at the base of anything, any program you have, any business sort of approach is strategy. Um, so it's sort of you know for me it's bread and butter, but it's not always something that we take the time to do. Um, but it's really what it means in this context is focusing on the under you know focusing on understanding business needs and creating a holistic strategy for ongoing success. Uh, the second is experience. So look, coming back to the art and the, you know, art around marketing and, uh, and engagement and content and the orchestration of that. 
um, you know, required to be able to engage. And the third is, is marketing. So this is kind of like my, um, if anyone's familiar with Mean Girls, um, this is kind of like my fetch. Um, and so marketing, if you haven't heard it before, it means sales and marketing, um, not smarter marketing as, as one of my ex-colleagues uh, thought it was. Um, so, but, but it, you know, it is what it, it means. It's, it's focusing on strategically, operationally and practically aligning with sales to for for success and it is essential from a buying group marketing perspective um the other thing that i wanted to touch on here is that buying group marketing it's something that is really dependent on the organization and the maturity of an organization in where they are from a journey perspective like there needs to be some maturity in terms of understanding your audience because it, it is very laser focused and it, it, it is a, an approach that um, really will help with precision. So there's that. So if we go into, you know, some of the fundamentals, so the fundamentals around strategy and, you know, just at the top, it's around your target accounts and ICP and prioritization. And, you know, I think, uh, for, for the majority of marketers, they, you know, we have, we've already established those. Um, I think it's about an ongoing discussion and, rela and relationship with sales to make sure that, that what you have determined is accurate and still on point in terms of what, what's happening in market and what's happening in terms of pipeline. So that's one thing. The other, the other part of this is around understanding the architecture of your B2B buying groups. So really, you know, who's who in the zoo? Who are your key stakeholders? Who are your influencers? Who needs to implement? Who needs to approve and so on and so forth? Um, and as a part of this, it's being really clear about your personas and their needs and what role they play in the buying group. So, you know, understanding, okay, well, what are their pain points and being able to respond to them from, uh, from that level? Um, so as I continue sort of into strategy, I thought I'd share this as a resource. This is something that, that we're looking at at Influ2, and I, I thought it might be interesting to share it um, with, with the group here. So, you know, Gartner has what it calls its enterprise technology adoption profiles. Um, and really, if you look at, you know, it's, it's structured uh, similarly to a personality profile so, uh, or personality assessment, rather, so the MBIT or MBIT uh, assessment. And essentially what it does is it's seven questions that you answer about uh, what your target accounts, you know, the traits of your target accounts. So you can either answer it or you can get your customers to answer it. And what it does is it builds up um, a profile around these three key areas. So planning, you know, how adaptable are they with their, you know, with their technology plans? You know, who, who has control of the technology agenda and the pace of change? So, you know, how the account reacts to change. So if you're trying to sell them a massive platform and um, they need to implement it, what, what's that chain of command going to be? What's that implementation going to be like? Um, at that organization. So essentially, you know, we're looking at uh, when you fill out the survey, um, it gives you a profile of who, uh, of, of what your accounts are. Um, and essentially it's kind of like a personality profile. And then Gartner has a lot of different resources to be able to help um, how you approach that. Um, so it's really looking at essentially the psychographics of what your account or what your account is. And for me, this is interesting because I think it takes it takes that account beyond just the firmographics of, of you know, uh, how many employees, what what are they, uh, you know, what's their revenue and so on and so forth and starts to really take it into it from a, a, a needs base. Um, and the question for me here, um, you know, to the audience is, um, you know, has your organization considered target account psychographics in its ICP? I'm really curious to know if anyone else has, has tried this. Um, and the answers are yes, we're practically psychic when it comes to our accounts, um, or no, we hadn't considered account psychographics yet. So I'll, um, I'll give it a bit of a, a minute for us to sort of roll through. Um, and this is a little bit of a selfish poll for me because I'm kind. I, I want to know who who's doing it, so um, because it's something I'm considering um, looking at for Influ too. Cool. So I think we're still rolling through. I'll, I'll give it a minute. Awesome. So it looks like 
we've got about 12% of our audience. So um, that, that yes, they're psychic when it comes to their accounts. I, I love that. Um, I'd love to, love to hear more about that if we, uh, if we can in, in, uh, in, from a sharing perspective in the questions. Um, but I think from the majority, the majority of the audience, it looks like 89% hasn't yet considered it. So um, hopefully that's a helpful resource for you to, to think about. Um, so I'm going to keep going. Um, so moving on to experience. So, you know, experience is really um, coming back to your content and looking at content that's related to your prospect and customer pain points. And this sounds um, this sounds like it's something that is uh, just a no-brainer. But I think, you know, one of the things that I've found from my own experience is, you know, I can get so in-depth. Um, from a marketing perspective and just in the day to day, I think it's, you know, it's about stepping back and being able to connect one with your customers and to, to find out like, you know, what their experience is, is with the product or questions they have, and also with your sales team around what they're hearing in market um, and how that conversation is evolving or changing. So, you know, that's, that's one thing. It's also about with content, um, you know, looking at diversity from a creative perspective and also the channels where your prospects play. So, you know, I think I have this bias as a B2B marketer that, you know, there are certain channels that are going to be better than others in terms of, you know, in terms of being able to reach the audience who I want to reach. Um, you know, and typically I have a bias from a social media perspective around, around the Facebook, Instagram um, of the world, because, you know, for me personally, I use them as, as a, as a personal channel, but like, I will say, uh, one of the other channels that I've recently got into is TikTok. And, um, so it, uh, yesterday, as it so happens, um, you know, I got targeted, uh, for an ebook about funnel metrics, which is something I'm interested in at the moment. And um, there are really, <laughs> there's typically no B2B, I don't get B2B advertising on TikTok. And so because I got that ad and I, I took the time to look at it and I actually downloaded. So, you know, for me, that's a lesson to myself around, okay, there are these other channels and though they may, may be nascent, it's probably worth thinking about who, how they're growing, how their audience is growing and two, you know, there are a lot of channels that existing channels that are very saturated with a lot of content and a lot of information. And so what these channels offer you is the ability to reach out to your audience in a channel that's not necessarily B2B saturated. So I think being able to think about how, you know, how you're um, pushing through your creative is one thing. Um, I really, that's why I really resonate with TikTok it's video and usually it's very creative and I, I just I'm amazed by what some people do on it and I I, I love that um, but it's also it's not crowded with a with a with a lot of um, advertising from from a lot of other advertisers so it, it helps uh, it helps you stand out you know and then this goes to the third point around mapping and planning for orchestration throughout the prospect journey. So it's all well and good to have all of this information and be able to push out, but it really does need to be orchestrated in a way. So for example, with the Influ2, with the Influ2 new reality campaign, it really was about understanding where that, where those prospects were, where those accounts were through the journey and making sure you're serving them the right content in the context of the conversation that they're having and in the context of what their needs are. Um, so that's, you know, that, those are really some of the fundamentals around uh, the experience pillar. And what I wanted to talk about, one of the examples that, um, you know, a case study that we'd done last year with um, a company called ProfitWell, um, and what, what I really wanted to touch on with ProfitWell was I was so impressed with, with their content and what they produced and how they, were, how they were doing it to be able to really connect back with their user and show the value of their, of their brand. So essentially, as, a, as an overview, um, uh, you know, ProfitWell created a, a video series. So uh, they, there's two of them. There's one called Boxed Out and there's one called Pricing Page Teardown. Um, and it's a series that analyzes, you know, some of the pain points or what, what their existing target audience is doing. And they, they go through and they'll do like an, an audit of them um, and then produce that and push that out. What they then do is they take the content and they push it out into different formats and distribute it across across different channels, essentially targeting that account with that with that content. So it's you know uh, 
you know, whether it's email, whether it's advertising. And so, you know, in this third example, you can see where it's relevant. They've personalized it um, to be able to connect back with the with the buying group members of uh, within that t- target account. And I will say, you know, this personalization doesn't always have to be saying someone's name or um, or showing their logo. It, it needs to be thought about in terms of the context of what what their needs are and what you're trying to communicate to them. But in for profit well in this example, that's that's that was what helped. Um, you know, and some of the the outcome from this, you know, they had uh, their this, you know, one of their sales team was trying to reach out to a GM of a of a particular brand. And when when they had done the the outreach in uh, in outreach, um, you know, the the t- the prospect had come back and said, Yes, um, I just saw your personalized ad, and it was on. It was through Instagram. So you know that starts to help tie in and that understanding around. Okay, how important is the orchestration of of timing and, and the relevance of content between sales and marketing? Because if you if you time it really well, these are the these, this is the sort of result you can see. And for profit, well, you know, for this this program that they're running. Um, they had a 23% increase in their, their banner CTRs. Uh, they had a 40% increase in uh, the buying group engagement across their target, you know, the target accounts that they were they were running through this campaign. Um, and 67% of that audience of, of target accounts converted, um, which drove up their enterprise deals one. So 111% uh, percent, uh, from, from what the baseline was. But I think you know, the MasterCard priceless moment is this call out from, um, you know, from Jay Kapoor, who, you know, he he sort of says, he calls out profit well in terms of their content and what, and and this particular program. Um, And the quote here is, and excuse me, because my eyesight is really not great. um, I always think if this is the depth of insight that they put out for free, imagine the wealth of info a customer gets when they actually paid. So like, that being able to have that acknowledgement um, and be able to create content that you can push out and and starts to uh, address buying pain points but show the value of your of your product really helps connect connect the dots on that from that perspective. Um, so that that was the the profit well example. Um, so moving into our final pillar of uh, around around marketing, um, you know this is I think something that in B2B marketing is always, it's something we always talk about sales and marketing alignment, but really, you know, what does that mean? Because for buying group, for a buying group marketing approach, it is essential. You know, you can't really do buying group marketing without having alignment with sales. So really it's around the agreement around the, the prospect journey stages, particularly as you can, you know, from the previous example, understanding where the prospect is, what they're doing and being able to coordinate what that journey is. And those don't always remain static. They're not the same across the board. So depending on your, you know, what your program is, who your audience is, um, and uh, you know, that's something probably to look at every every so often to make sure that uh, that you're you're hitting the mark. Um, the other thing that uh, that I think for me is very interested in interesting is uh, shared metrics and accountability between sales and marketing. So, you know, we have these SLAs, but there's, you know, I think there's an opportunity to be able to look at, okay, well, how, what metrics should we share um, and be accountable for collectively? And then what, what is marketing responsible for to drive to that? What is sales responsible for to drive to that? So that's something that I think there's an opportunity and a lot of you know, uh, you know, I've started to see this movement within the within the industry happen, but I think that's going to become more and more commonplace. The other thing is understanding and mapping how teams will work across an account. So typically, account planning or account mapping happens from a sales perspective, and it depends on who your audience is. If it's if it's more enterprise, then hopefully uh, marketing is involved in that as well. But really, for buying group marketing, it's being a part of that account planning really understanding how you're working together and how you're how you're being coordinated to make sure that you're you're helping right through to the bottom of the funnel um and so what i would like to do is launch uh, my this is my last poll i promise you um so what i want to know is from the audience who is actually unifying their sales and marketing funnels and metrics 
So, you know, the answers are yes, we're fully marketing integrated. Uh, the second one is we're actively building towards this approach or no, sales and marketing metrics remain separate. So I'll, um, I'll give it a minute for uh, everyone to respond. I'm going to have a sip of water. Cool. So I think we've, we've got a bit of a split, a bit of a split group. It's kind of, it's nice to see that um, I think the majority are working. Oh, well, there seems to be just a slight, slight majority are working, you know, are, are fully marketing integrated and uh, are actively working towards it. Um, so that's, that's great to see that, 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 that's something that's coming through. And I think, you know, from a B2B marketing perspective, it, it's super important. So I'll keep, keep rolling. Um, and I'm, I'm, apologies for the slide. Uh, I'm not sure what, what's happened in the upload, but there in the, I will mention in the handouts, we have um, the PDF of the presentation. So if you want to go back and have a look, um, please, please do so. Um, so, you know, I think we all realize from the poll results uh, with a lot of businesses moving to, towards this unification between metrics and, and, and in the funnel, you know, the, the business benefits of this are, are really just making the, um, the, the results more trackable, predictable, and, and be able to report cleanly, um, which means that, you know, if you have that, cle that cleared up, then you can really focus on the activity that you need to deliver and, and being able to coordinate through it. It also starts to become a lot more granular, um, which really starts to help with uh, channel attribution. So there's no, like, um, the leads aren't working or you're not following up on the leads or whatever it is, it's, it start, you start, should be able to start to see, okay, well, what is driving, what is driving results and what isn't? And where do we, where do we, where's, where do we have the opportunity to improve? Finally, it's, it's about that increased accountability um, between, between sales and marketing and having that understanding. And, you know, from a experience uh, perspective, you know, the benefits are, just helping to prioritize and uh, and accelerate efforts around around who's hot and you know who's in in market, um, being able to focus on the buying group and and really understand their sentiment and and capture their their intent and and work with that collectively throughout the funnel, as well as creating for marketing creating the messaging that matches the role of the buyers and, and are relevant to their to their sales stage, so. You know, that's why it, it is really important from a buying group marketing that there is unification. Um, and one of the things I wanted to share was um, this is something that Influ2 had, had um, we'd, we'd launched last year, which was a buying group engagement score. Um, and it's a score that's relative to the performance of um, the campaigns in the Influ2 platform. Uh, and really what the score looks at is across aggregated across a campaign and across an account the in, you know the individual engagement uh, what that equates to in terms of probability to convert um, against against baselines so um, you know if you look at the score the range is between zero and 80 where um, anything at 10 plus is considered engaged across a campaign and sort of ready to hand to sales and I will say with that that is a you know, depending on your organization, depending on your product, um, and depending on your sales motion as well, uh, and, and marketing activities, it probably you probably need to um, calibrate that for against those against those factors. But essentially, you know, if you look at uh, engagement being at that ten plus level, then you know that that indicates when an account is you know at a prob you know at a probability where you can hand it across to sales and then work through the funnel. Um, to be able to to close and uh, you know if from the campaigns if you are running uh, full funnel campaigns then you're able to sort of track that engagement through the funnel to see how that engagement works and so that's just one metric you know that can be can be looked at and thought of um, to be a unifier between sales and marketing in terms of um, the efforts and, and output from that it's also something to sort of think about uh, in terms of where does it sit within your lead scoring? Is that something that can enhance enhance your your lead scoring and being being able to push through to sales? Um, so 
you know, these are, it's all well and good to want to merge all of this together, but I think sometimes there are sort of the, the some of the things that you don't necessarily think of uh, from a theory perspective and uh, these are just some considerations for when you're merging metrics. Um, you know, and the first one is <laughs> Rome wasn't built in a day and nor is a robust marketing program. Um, you know, I think I was on a, a webinar recently with um, Malachi Thread. Threadgill, so he's uh, an analyst from uh, Forrester and, yeah, you know, heading the ABM practice there. So, um, you know, and he was mentioning that a lot of uh, organisations do pilots and, you know, the, the tenure of a CMO is is two years and sometimes their sales cycle is longer than that. And so there's there needs to essentially be some understanding around what, you know, what you're working towards and education around what, realistically we, you can look for in terms of time frames for delivery of those results um, and being able to have that because if you don't allow if you don't allow a program the time to develop um, and at the time to sort of test it and learn from it and be able to, to implement the insights then you know and you're moving on to the next thing it's probably probably not going to be the most effective um, and then the second one is MQL is not short for magically qualified lead um, so you know, MQLs are a signal of engagement. There's a lot of focus on them. There's also a lot of focus around uh, whether they're dying or, you know, whether they should be the focus for leads. Um, again, you know, from referring to that conversation with Malachi, it, he really talked about, um, you know, using them as an as a signal together with other together with other um, data data points to be able to understand what where the MQL sits from a context perspective. So if you combine, you know, that MQL engagement together with your closed lost, your first party data um, and intent data, then that starts to give you a bit a bit more of a clearer picture. And I think that's something that um, that really needs to, to be looked at. The other thing that I think is good to consider from an MQL perspective is, um, you know, and as we as we're talking about with buying group marketing, it's not just one person that is going to drive that uh, is going to drive that whole sales conversation. Um, so it's thinking about okay, well, you know, is is one person who is you know at a hundred of your score versus four people at like thirty, you know, what what is the strongest signal there? And I think some some of that needs to be calculated into into the consideration for an MQL. Um, the third point is around target account. Target accounts aren't always in market. It's just that's just the nature of that's the nature of of um, of how how businesses work. You know, if you look at say for example uh, marketing automation platforms, you know, if you have a subscription and you sign up for a new subscription uh, for a year or whatever it is, it's going to take you at least a good quarter to be able to implement it and then to be able to set up your programs and see results. So you know, this I think. You know, everyone's uh, the way that uh, I don't say everyone, but the major way the majority of um, you know businesses operate is they think everyone is in, in wants to hear about their about their product right now, um, and that's just not necessarily true. So I think you know being able to normalize a, your audience and understand okay who actually is in market and who should you focus on to be able to you know to to. Uh, invest in them and keep you know keep everyone else sort of got a, sort of warm from a brand perspective great but that will help with your budget efficiency and deal velocity and I think that's something that um, you know is is becoming more and more commonplace um, with you know the advent of intent data and uh, and and those and predictive insights from that perspective so those are some considerations um, and so sorry I'm trying to advance this slide and so finally, um, you know, where I want to leave you is with Influ2 is, is really invested in, in buying group marketing and being able to help its customers really focus on that. And uh, this is a, just a preview of uh, one of our, our products that we've got coming out later in the year that really helps to look at bringing together um, sales and marketing through metrics. So and from, from a campaign perspective of, of uh, digital advertising. So 
you know, really what, what it looks at is starting to bring in um, the opportunity focus metrics and how they relate to the, to the campaigns, being able to monitor the buying groups and their progression through the funnel, so having a map of that, and then also tracking the, the engagement with them and where how your sales and marketing alignment, um, you know, is the health of that, where there are, like, with different accounts, if there are gaps or if, if there's an opportunity to for one or the other to be able to improve. Um, the other part of this is being able to really look at the, each of the individual campaigns from based on their persona or, or, or essentially their cohort. So looking at each of those individuals, you know, in, in that buying group and being able to have campaigns that are driven specifically to them so that you collectively have, you know, them moving through that, that the funnel um, together and having their needs met. Um, so that's a little bit of a preview. And again, I apologize for the rendering of this, but feel free to, to go into the handout section and, and, and download the PDF. Um, and really, that's that's all I have today. So um, thank you for thank you for answering my polls and thank you for attending. Cynthia, I'll, um, I'll hand it back to you. Excellent. Thanks so much, Narosha. And we're not quite done yet. We've got some questions. So uh, let's get started. Our first question is from Marie. How does my sales team stay informed through Influ2 during the customer journey? Sorry, could you say that again to me? Sure, no problem. How does my sales team um, stay informed through Influ2 during the customer journey? Sure. So, you know, with the Influ2 insights that come back out, they can be connected through to your CRM to have notifications or they can be pushed through into your lead scoring to be able to be taken into account from that perspective. So um, that's that's something that I think is, um, you, you know, you, you definitely need to make, be able to make those connections, usually into the CRM and having those notifications or from the CR, you know, from Influ2 into the CRM through to your, say, sales engagement platform like outreach or sales loft or something like that um, and being able to, to kick off your, your automated workflows from there. Okay, great. Thank you. Our next question is from, uh, Mc I think it's Michael, but, um, or Michelle V. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the funnel sh you showed started with accounts, your customers, right? How about running um, buyer group marketing for unknown prospects? Yeah, so... Um, you know, if I, I'll, I'll comment on this from a, from a, uh, Influ2 perspective. So if you if you have your strategy in place and you know, you know, who your ICP is, who your personas are, um, and who you want to target, then yes, you can start, you know, you can use our tool to be able to find, you know, similar accounts and be able to run campaigns, uh, against them to be able to, and, and look at the engagement from that perspective. And that's that's uh, that's a way to be able to uh, look at the white space around you know out, outside of uh, your target accounts. Hopefully that that answers your question. Perfect. Our next question is from Frank. Um, how do I get started on aligning sales and marketing metrics? Uh, good question. <laughs> uh, for me, I, I'm 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 trying to do this right now. So for me, I'm I'm really going through and looking at what are my top level metrics across across the marketing team that I want that I want to care about, and then what you know what I look at from a you know down the department uh, down the department uh, perspective. Um, so um, you know. I would start with a conversation, with establishing that, having a conversation with sales, looking at what they're at what they're prioritizing and what they're doing, and from there co-building out the metrics. Um, in terms of the, you know, some of the metrics that that um, that you that you're looking at, for me, I'm starting to look beyond, you know, just the leads that we're producing. I am looking at like what's that, like what and having targets around sales accepted leads and SQLs and so on and so forth. But it's still a little bit of a journey. But you know, that's that I, I'm curious to to know if anyone else um, within the audience has has uh, how they've they've approached it because we did have a couple within the poll who um, who were actually had already unified um, and 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 had achieved that. Yes, if you do have a response for Narosha, you can type that right in the Q&A for her. 
I think we have one more question, Narosha, and it's from Eric. How does Influ2 help find buying groups to target? Um, so again, this kind of relates uh, back to the to to the earlier question um, around um, you, you know being able. You really need to be able to have your strategy in place, understand who you want to target, understand you know who's within that buying group, and then be able to. You can utilize the Influ Two platform to be able to tar really target them and start to look at that engagement across that across that account. And so that starts to really be able to help you target from that that perspective, and then you you you're able to look at that engagement and and pass that through to your sales team. All right, great. Well, Narosha, those are all the questions we have right now, and I believe uh, we're at the end of our presentation. So I'd want to thank you very much uh, for this insightful presentation. And if we didn't get to any of your comments, uh, we will be sure to pass it along to Narosha. On behalf of MarTech, I want to thank everyone in our audience for attending this webinar. We hope you join us again soon. Thank you.